um, doing the special graduate study PhD program and also doing the uh, literary arts MFA program. Um, in screen in particular, I think, you can see Noah's interest in fiction and playability and his particular interest in what I would call surface and depth or what lies beneath the interface. And I think it's not for nothing that expressive processing, the book from which he will be speaking today or about which he will be speaking today, proceeds from two basic questions. What matters in understanding digital media? Is looking at the external appearance and audience experience of software enough, or should we look further? So with that note, I present to you Noah Wardrop Fruin. OK, so um, being a, um, you know, male of a certain age who's about to talk about games and things. You probably expect me to begin with my kind of sepia-toned memories of the Atari VCS, right? Or 2600 as it came to be known. Maybe I'll talk about the elegant balance of combat, the two-player only cartridge that came with every copy of the VCS. Tell you about how, you know, my cousin and I would have, you know, hours of fun together on the couch with apparently a sort of larger and larger group of relatives around us. Um, but I'm actually not going to talk about any of that. Um, I hated going over to my cousins and playing on the Atari. He would always beat me. It was really boring and frustrating. And I would want to go home and play real computer games, right? I mean, like, so we had an Osborne and a Capro, right? Like, real computers. And, um, and the kinds of games that, you know, I was really involved in on the computer were games that weren't, you know, sort of Twitch action games, but games from genres like fantasy, mystery, science fiction, right? Um, so on some level, that's going to be where I'm coming from today. But if I was actually going to tell you about my high school experience and my high school gaming experience, I'd probably have to spend a lot more time talking about this. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's even worse, right? Um, and of course, you know, like any aficionado, while the plebeian group had their broad taste. I had specialized tastes, right? So um, I particularly liked the character creation system in Champions. And while there's now Champions online, I can assure you that however many hours I might spend on it, they will always be dwarfed by the hours spent with uh, the tabletop champions. And then you may have heard of Mercenary Spies and Private Eyes. It's actually mostly famous for the fact that it was unplayable as published. There were no movement rules. Um, but I thought it was a really interesting, elegant little system. And in fact, uh, it had a sort of human-operated algorithm in it for how to create private eye scenarios that I actually uh, you know, have shared with creative writing students at Brown and other places because uh, you know, I thought it was particularly interesting. I was also interested in more systemic types of play, so much as I've um, played much more uh, tabletop champions than ever computer champions, the same with Civilization, right? You know, many a 12-hour day playing tabletop Civilization with the soundtrack to uh, Peter Gabriel's soundtrack to The Last Temptation of Christ on repeat and so on, <laughs> right? So, uh, okay, enough of that sort of uh, embarrassing revealing history. Um, Let's actually uh, ask why I'm, I'm giving you this elaborate setup, right? Well, part of what I want to do today is talk about role-playing games. So uh, apologies to those of you who already know this, but um, a little background. So um, as you no doubt know, uh, we've had abstract war games for a long time, right? And then growing out of that tradition and out of a traditional kind of military simulation, we got um, more and more detailed uh, tabletop war games, right? So this happens to be a picture of Gary Gygax playing one of these games. But you, know, you have the units that represent different types, like this is an armored division, say. There's different kinds of cover. There's different kinds of movement. And when you're playing one of these games, you're constantly thinking about systems, right? You're thinking like, okay, you know, what, where in its reloading cycle is my artillery? You're thinking, how are my supply lines doing? You're thinking, and so on and so on. Um, now, we make another transition from this kind of game with the arrival of Dungeons and Dragons, the first tabletop role playing game, um, although there's a sort of in between stage with the fantasy supplement to Chainmail. So one of the transitions that happens is that the miniatures move from being groups to individuals, right? So instead of an armored division, you would have the kind of individual that you might find in, uh, say, Tolkien or Howard or other kinds of fantasy literature. 
Um, there's also a move from the sort of maps of large battlefields to constrained dungeons. It's less about movement for things like flanking and more about movement that's about sort of choosing the course that you will pick through a space that has you know, many possibilities in it. And I would argue that um, there's an, maybe another kind of movement that isn't quite as obvious, right? And that's the movement of complex processes from the forefront of each player's mind, right? Thinking about like, okay, where is my artillery and it's reloading? Ma mainly to the mind of the dungeon master, right? So the dungeon master being that player who sits behind the screens and sits behind those screens in the sort of, you know, uh, normal picture of tabletop role playing because they're doing things like rolling die behind the screens or looking at tables that are printed on the screens and so on. And the dungeon master is the player who's in charge of thinking about a lot of these processes and is in charge of those processes to create a certain kind of space, I'd argue, for the other players. And that, I'd say, is a space to perform character and story, right? So a session of tabletop role-playing is a collaborative storytelling and game-playing experience where the dungeon master is in charge of all the non-player characters and many processes in the world, and the characters are in charge of sort of their characters, their actions, playing those roles through the story. Now, as you also all uh, almost undoubtedly are aware, we now have computer role-playing games that are relatively direct descendants in certain ways of tabletop role-playing games. So, um, for example, the model of combat as statistics, right? Statistics with probabilities and so on that, um, that is inherited from war games into tabletop role-playing games is in, inherited into um, the computer role-playing game, and that is also expressed in terms of character development, right? So you might see here like a tabletop role-playing game character sheet, and here a screen from the computer role-playing game Mass Effect. And in both cases, you get experience points, you deploy those experience points to get better at certain things. Those things are things that you might do during combat, or they might be things like trying to sense what's in a room, or be able to interpret material, and so on. And then there's another kind of transition, and that is that the sort of collaborative performance around the table of tabletop role playing is replaced by rich media representations. So um, rather than a dungeon master who plays the non player characters, you have animations created by animators and voice acting by voice actors, and then you have you know, things that are written by writers for the non player character to say, and then options that are also written by writers for what the player character might say. And to Together, these are meant to replace the collaborative performance of story and character with another kind of sort of system for story and character.